Welcome back everyone to theCUBE's coverage here in Orlando, Florida. I'm John Furrier, host of theCUBE with Shelly Kramer. We're here at Click Connect 2024. I got a great guest coming on, Drew Clark, GM and Executive Vice President of the Data Business Unit. Drew, great to have you on theCUBE. John, glad to be here. And great, great. Shelly, nice to meet you as well. Right. Great to see you on stage, in the, and I got to say, I'm very impressed. Obviously, data without, AI without data is no AI. Everyone kind of knows that now. But data, if you've done the work, generative AI is an opportunity immediately. You guys showed some demos that weren't smoke and mirrors, real demos. That's right. Products that are going to shipping less than a month from on-stage performance. You guys are in a good position, and data is now the value proposition. It's not on the ingredient, it is the product. Yeah. The software with data is the end game, and with generative AI, a whole new category is right around the corner of new applications. You guys are in the middle of it. What, what's, the, what's the sentiment? Uh, we're so excited to, to be here, to be able to showcase all the work we've been doing. And that work goes all the way back on decades. The same infrastructure and discipline you have to do about feeding data into an application or analytics, it's that same kind of foundation for the new kind of use cases like you're describing as generative AI. All right, that's a new consumption vehicle for needing that data pipeline. So we've been doing it working on it, and we're excited just to bring it all so together. So a couple key uh, points in the keynote that you guys are highlighting here. One is obviously answers, which is the result of having all that data. <laughs> we were joking on our intro uh, keynote analysis. You go back a decade, 14 years ago or so, Hadoop was the craze, big data. Ask good questions and maybe you'll get answers. Now the questions aren't even in there. The data is already baked in. The answers are being generated from great data management, great data capabilities. And now you've got the talent cloud, right? So you've got the talent right. cloud and you've got now a new user experience on productivity. Talk about those two things, the talent cloud and how that productivity piece from the data emerges. Yeah, so think of it as a foundation or a data foundation and that's what Click Talent Cloud is. It's about getting the data from where it happens to be. When you go buy something at a department store, that transaction is written right into an SAP or a mainframe system. That foundation says, okay, I have to get that data to that new answer, that new uh, click answer on that piece. So the way you think about it, Click Talent Cloud Foundation for data and it's what's needed. You know, I was looking at the report that you did, you just released in conjunction yep. with ETR, who happens to be a research partner of ours as well. And one of the things, when we're talking about data, um, one of the things that's so interesting to me, I mean, you've been in the data business for a long time, so all of the importance of data, this isn't news to you, you've been building this for 30 years. But some of the data points from the research study spoke to some real challenges here, like 64% of the survey respondents said that their people never use unstructured data to derive insights. 64%, that's yeah. a lot. 70% um, said they barely begun to even realize the value of their data. So I think that that really is, to me, what makes this such an yeah. exciting moment because you just have Greenfield ahead and we were talking about TAM earlier yeah, and you, you were quizzing you know, about yeah. expected TAM, but I think this really is an has to be an exciting time for Click. Well, and, you're, and you're owning in on an important part of that study, which was about that unstructured data. Right. And actually, I had the opposite reaction of, you know, I was like, wow, that's actually a bigger number than I thought yeah. uh, that, <laughs> was, that we're using it. Because when you think about unstructured data, and a lot of people, oh, it's um, X or Twitter yeah. or it's emails, but when you think about all the documents and everything that's generated by a company, it's just, it dwarfs it's structured data. And to be able to harness and access that and deliver it, that is a just, uh, it, it's a big tailwind for us, yeah. is the way we think of it, yeah. you know, from going, needing our platforms. And, and more importantly, it's inspiring for our customers to see what they're doing now and how they can use our platform yeah to accomplish their missions, and that's where I get excited. Yeah. And I think the unstructured data also speaks to the generative AI opportunity that you guys have, because now you have multimodal assets. You have unstructured, structured data, but also you've got a lot of new, kind of loose information hanging around, whether it's from IoT devices, anything that's being measured on the, on the network can yeah. be measured now. So, right. yeah, we talked about the sports segment earlier, <laughs> analytics for player performance. You guys have a lot of customers in sports analytics. Okay, well, business is now, situationally aware of what's going on. Execution in sports and business are now kind of converging. Yeah. The nexus of performance is going to be the tech athlete, the business person. I mean, that's kind of where this is going. I mean, this is where the, the, the well, 360. I, yeah, it's interesting, John, you're using a sports uh, analogy because, 
Oh, he's always this way. Always. Yeah. Yeah. All right. Yeah. <laughs> we had a hockey and, guy on earlier. We loved okay. him. Okay. Well, we got it. And well, but there are also kind of rules and implications yeah. if you don't use the data correctly, right? And so, yes, you have access to it. But you know, you look at in the European Union, they have the AI Act, and if you're using AI for decision making and you can't back it up, or you're, worse, you're using data you shouldn't be using, that's a foul, right? And you could get disqualified, and or even worse, penalized at pretty significant ways. So there is a responsibility uh, to using this data right. Just because you can yeah, yeah. doesn't mean you should. Yeah. And you guys had a great trust message. I thought on stage was hit that point home. And, and I got to call out and say, I've never seen a company on stage say, on a keynote, data supply chain in context to the overall value proposition. Um, that is really to unpack data supply chain. You're talking about kind of the concept of software supply chain in a security context. So LLNs yeah. with hallucinations point to gaps in data. If data's not available, you start to see these hallucinations. And as unstructured becomes vectorized, and you guys talked a lot about vectors as well, you have now retrieval search, retrieval kind of yep. uh, aspects of the data. So now everything is available, right? So now you have, okay, what does that mean for the, for the user? Um, it means more data scientists basically going to born, be born in the, in the wild now with data. So it's, it's a fundamental game changer. So how do you guys see that expanding beyond the software? Because now data is the product. Yeah. Data yeah. is the product. And that's, and, and you need to apply, you know, product design principles, and it's almost easier to get, if we take a step out of the software or the tech industry and go, okay, well, let's think about consumer-oriented products. And a consumer-oriented product that you could buy at the supermarket, Crest or Procter & Gamble, and the decisions around what's in that product, how it's kind of built, who's buying it, how do you have that response and the iteration, where did it come from? And you go all the way back, and how did it get to kind of that marketplace? Those same principles is what we can do and are doing with that data supply chain. It's treating it, not just getting it to the shelf, but when it's on the shelf, is it high up, is it low down? How much is it being picked up? Is it being used? And, all, and the data product owners, these are new, and these are new jobs. Some of them I've met here, and it's like, wow, you're coming at it like a consumer product person. And that's the differentiation. And the trust yeah. piece, and then the explainable AI was a huge wave right on it. People don't even know what that means, but mm. the answer is, you got to be able to explain, is this data coming from authentic sources? And with synthetic data, there's a lot of new data sources out there. The, whole, the game is changing. I mean, the, the, the data sets are changing, the data changes. How do you guys keep up with it? Give a scope the problems uh, and opportunity there for us. As you look at the landscape, more data is coming in, unstructured. That's right. Different James. types of data is coming in. The rise of synthetic data is now huge. Open data formats are dominating. Well, I would, John, I would maybe think of it in a way, uh, and almost put yourself as a user and an experience, and go because you brought up the word trust, right? And you're using hallucinations, which are like, okay, that's generative AI spinning out and kind of giving out random kind of answers. But if you were to, you know, say, all right, I'm interacting with a company and I want to know the latest uh, information about my account balance, yeah. you know, if the number's wrong, you lose trust pretty quickly, <laughs> you know, like, wait a minute, that's not right. And that's where we're spending the time of, it's, and it's not just unstructured data kind of assembling yeah. into that generative AI, it's that di structured data, like an account balance, statuses of a shipment, and that needs to be the most current information because if we lose your trust, why would you come back, right? And yeah. that's what, when we realize our customers are going through that experience to say, we have to build this new product, but what we put in there, it's got to be right. Yeah, yeah, there's no tolerance. There's zero tolerance for not being accurate 100% in the enterprise. That's this right. data is people relied on day in and day out. It's not just a search query, like on, we see in OpenAI and, and, and chat GPTs of the world. Okay, I can get a little, I can, I can dissect it, but in the enterprise, you're dealing with really mission critical workloads, end to end, another, right. another big theme. You know, I have a question. Um, one of the things that, that you covered in this research study was um, people who, don't, who indicated they don't have any plans 
to start using GenAI and these solutions for managing their data. And you know, not surprisingly, 53% 50, said, we just don't have the expertise needed. And you know, another 47%, we, we haven't seen any value from GenAI tools. It's, so it seems to me there's a lot of opportunity there for customer education and for, I know that a lot of what you're focused on also is bringing training and the importance of regular training to employees, creating a culture of data and understanding what that is and all of that sort of thing. So talk to us a little bit about that, what you see ahead. Yeah, so Shelly, we've talked about data literacy as a company before, which is about uh, reading, writing, understanding, and arguing with data, because yeah. literacy is more yeah. than you know, just that. Accepting. And so as we invested and we had the data literacy project, uh, which was around that first fundamentals, well, generative AI, when you talk about these use cases and the plans, are you going to use that? What people are now taking a, a step back on is, what is the art of the possible for new kind of new ways of working with and delivering products to a customer or solution? And I think that's the part where people are, can see a couple of easy things of, well, I can improve productivity. So I can compress the short and uh, an amount of time to read and write, maybe understand. So okay, productivity is done. Arguing with data, that's the thinking part. That one is, that one is where people are going, all right, well, is this the right use case that's going to really um, help deliver a new way of kind of delivering on our product? So what we're doing is we're A, you know, expanding on that data literacy project, mm -hmm. we're B, working with our executive advisory council, the AI council you're talking yeah. to later, yeah. and we're evolving kind of that uh, capabilities we have where, look, we have the art of the possible technologically, but what is it that you're trying to do from a literacy consumption usage of that information? So that's where we're going. Makes perfect so you're sense. on the front lines with customers and they're looking at AI and the generative AI specifically, it's a new category. Okay, we talked about that. They're kind of getting their, they're, they're lining up their ducks, so to speak, and try to get in that world. Little budget shift from other cloud native or other activities into this generator, but you start to see now clear lines of sight around formation of budgets, investments, still light. You guys did a survey that came out, saw the press release, still lower on the adoption on the, on yeah, the, on the right. investment side. So investment adoption's coming quickly. We're seeing everyone focus on this bottoms up and top down throughout the organizations. What does the adoption curve look like? Is there indifference to generative AI? Was it from a budget standpoint or people leaning in hard? Are they taking baby steps to your point about accuracy? Yeah. You got to get a lot of prerequisites right to get it right and you don't want to take on any, any technical debt or business debt going into that. What is your view on uh, the adoption curve and, and the adoption cycle? John, you're exactly right. And the customers I talk to, everybody is talking about generative AI or AI. Every, and I ask, you know, I make a point of like, okay, so what are you doing about it? Is it stuff? Oh yeah, we have a top-down initiative, we have to do something about AI. Okay, great, what is it? Well, we don't know yet. And, um, <laughs> Retrieval, what are we trying to solve for? <laughs> and so, it. <laughs> so bottoms up, what we see is a lot of experimenting going on. Yeah. Right? And so similar to other data science and machine learning kind of cycles, there's experiments that are going on. So you've got budgets that have been put aside. Yeah. Uh, right now, experiments, uh, and then within the experiments, they're looking at what's the real cost drivers. Yeah. So and this is why, right, if you're going to run your own private Generative AI, well, okay, so now you have to have big, heavy machines, vector databases, where do you do it? There's a, all right, well, if I do it in a public cloud, I'm going to put all my information up there, right. and there's different cost structures that people are adjusting and looking at. Uh, it is squarely in the experiment phase. Uh, I think we'll see is next year more defined budgets yeah. as projects come in. I do know just about every company is experimenting right now, and where, ClickTown Cloud comes in is once you experiment, then the next question is do you have the trusted right data going into it? Yeah. And that's where our pipeline, yeah. our data supply chain <laughs> fits right into yeah. that. Yeah, and you guys are taking all the, the nice uh, cloud native kind of concepts, observability, uh, software supply chain, now data supply chain, starting to see the value of the data. Data marketplaces, I saw the announcement with AWS, again, more partnerships there, ecosystem building. Uh, the question I want to ask you is, is that as the data becomes the, the key part of the product, um, is there a uh, vision where you see Click's market changing from just analytics to just all applications? Because if you connect the dots, this is where it's going. It's like the data is in everything. 
Yeah. And so if that's there, there's no category for that. That's just basically. Sean, have you been in my office uh, <laughs> looking at the, my whiteboard? Yeah. Did, did I did actually, I, I, did did a nerve there? Yeah. Yeah. I mean, I think, uh, right, well, and this, this comes back to the enterprise uh, layer. So we're organized, as you've, I've been outlining, is you know, a data business unit, which is about, uh, we're about the foundation of data. Yeah. You know, Brendan, with the applications and the analytics and the, you know, the use of that data for business outcomes, and what's converging you know, very quickly at our largest enterprise customers is you need both, and you think about the pervasiveness of that data, yeah. and, and an application, is not a dashboard, an application is a phone and it's in the hands of the store manager and they're getting an alert that says, well, you know, your, your staffing is going to blow out of your budget for overtime, maybe you need to think about who you've got for your coverage for this coming weekend. That was a proactive data alert that went out to the store manager where they work on their phone. That's an application, that's data, that's, you know, it's not the traditional kind of view. Our TAM is much broader on just exactly that. Yeah, Shelly's on, on the CUBE research team, and one of the things we've observed and, and written about and published is that you know, past year, these events, the theme keeps popping back up. And if you look at NVIDIA and the silicon work being done yeah. around GPUs and NPUs, XPUs in general on the, on the hardware side, all the performance is targeting these end-to-end -end workloads. And so what we're seeing is the concept of end-to-end -end workloads with data as the new intellectual property. And mm. companies are, I hate to bring back the old asset balance sheet, the data is an asset on the balance sheet, but you're starting to see that workflows that are scoped and well understood and the data behind them are going to be retrofitted and reset with generative AI in mind, hence changing the game on what data is in there. So if you believe that to be true, then you say, okay, that's an intellectual property of the company. So then everything optimizes around that. What's your reaction to that? Do you believe that to be the case? And if so, how are companies looking yeah. at that and preparing themselves to, as they build the foundation, to lock in um, capabilities to support that? Okay, so there are two things there, John. That I was, as you are describing that, I was thinking through. <laughs> One is as an enterprise, and you think about uh, the architectures that they have to build up and the medallion architecture is pretty common now for uh, lake houses for, and that's like a bronze tier, which is your raw flat data, your silver, your gold, and classically it's a data lake, a data warehouse, to a data mart. All right, that needs to be reimagined as you think about at the top of the generative AI is like, well, what goes where and you have in that pipeline? Well, and then, uh, but you brought up NVIDIA and the chips and the GPUs, because if you just take that whole area, you take it up a level, and underneath is the compute, and the compute infrastructure that's needed to power all of that, and you're going to see this verticalization, I think in the next, and this is my opinion, yeah. in over the next 10 years, a verticalization just going from silica, uh, and then who knows what, you know, how quantum is going to really change right. the game on this, to the you know, infrastructure, to the velocity of kind of what's do, used where. And, you know, and uh, what, there's a new um, announcement from Elon's company with a chip in the brain yeah. being <laughs> able to use, right? So, yeah. Don't you so, have one? Um, <laughs> He's got all the yeah, answers, he must have one. <laughs> <laughs> but it, that verticalization yeah. from silica all the way to outcome, uh, I don't think it's as far away as no. we think it is. It's going to be in our lifetimes for sure. Dizzyingly how quickly all of this is evolving. I mean, it's so exciting. And every time I say that, somebody says, yes, it is exciting. But terrifying also works. <laughs> yeah, yeah, that's right. Well, that's it's right. great to have you on. We can go another hour and go in, into the weeds, but love real time. One last question on the real time. I know that's a big part of the announcement. Yeah. Data is only as good in, if it gets to the AI in the application, so making data low latency available is going to be a big challenge. How do you, what, how do you see that uh, uh, evolving very quickly? What's your vision on data availability or highly available data, highly, highly available data? How that you, word, that, yeah, that how, phrase, which right? Which word do we use? Highly available or high availability? This is a storage kind of yeah. data availability uh, problem. Well, so this is actually where the, and I'm thrilled to be representing and part of the data team that has changed data capture, uh, the background that we have, and this goes back to Attunity, and there's uh, 20 years of working at, as data has changed, or like that order I told you, that a little, little data point is done there. And then that has to go all the way through the chain and get to this point. You just need to move what changed. 
So change data capture is done. What Attunity has and with Click Replicate is a low latency means we're looking at the log files of what's changing. We don't have to bring down that source system and then we just move what's yeah. changed over to where it needs to. And this is uh, earlier today on live broadcast, Vanguard talked about how much data they're moving in real time to where it needs to. That's Click Replicate, that's our background. We have this running at scale. So this isn't new. Yeah. This is actually, we've been doing this for a long time you guys, with that, scale. Good, good, good yeah. job, final question to end the segment. How excited are you around the fact that Generative AI is here and how would you explain to someone watching what's different about Generative AI with Click going forward? What's going to be the big change in value and in, 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 uh, in, in user experience? How would you describe what's different in this new wave of Generative AI? New way, the, the new, or what's different is that uh, individuals will be able to do their jobs faster, better using the trusted data that's com you know comes from a great foundation, but it combines unstructured and structured. You get the right account balance, but they also know and that can have a conversation with you about that balance. That's what's different. Yeah. Drew Clark, General Manager, Executive Vice President here on the Cube with the Data Business Unit at Click. We're bringing you all the data here live on the Cube. Stay with us for more coverage from Orlando from Click Connect 24. We'll be back after the short break. <laughs>